And Lord, we thank you for Pastor Sean this morning and the word you've given him to deliver. You said you're looking for worshipers that will deliver in spirit and in truth. So we believe by faith, Lord, that not only will that happen, but that we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds because of your word. We give you glory. Bless him as he ministers, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. If you would, give your attention to the screen. A week before his resurrection, and just days before his crucifixion, Jesus entered the holy city of Jerusalem. He did not enter that city like a king. There was no chariot, there was no mighty horse. He entered that city on a donkey. Outside the city, the crowds gathered around to see their king, and they laid their palm branches on the dusty road, and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna simply means God save us. And that simple prayer echoes across time. 2,000 years ago, the Jerusalem crowds shouted Hosanna to their king on that dusty road. And 2,000 years later, wherever we are, we shout Hosanna, even still. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna in the lowest moments. Hosanna in the green pastures. Hosanna in the darkest valleys. Hosanna in the crowded cities. Hosanna in the open spaces. Hosanna in every church. Hosanna in every home. Hosanna in the victories. Hosanna in the failures. Hosanna in the beautiful beginnings and Hosanna in the bitter endings. Hosanna in the days of trial. Hosanna in the days of plenty. Hosanna in the days of sadness. Hosanna in the days of celebration. Hosanna in the morning and Hosanna in the evening. Hosanna in the sunshine and darkness. Hosanna in the years of waiting. Hosanna in the seasons of blessing. Hosanna all the time. Hosanna everywhere. Hosanna forever. Hosanna to the sun. Hosanna in the highest. He's worthy of your Hosanna. Save us, oh God. Save us. If that's you and you've been saved from something or you need to be saved from something or you're thankful about who your God is and about his shed blood on your behalf, then shout to him. Hosanna. Hosanna. Breath in your body. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. This is a great moment for us. We get another opportunity to hear the story of his triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. This is our holy week. This is a time where our Savior would prepare himself to do all that would need be done for each one of us. Nothing, everybody say nothing, nothing. can separate you from the love of your God. That's right. Nothing can separate you from the love of your God. In this moment, he enters in. And some might say, well, pastor, you, you, you don't know all the stuff that I've done. No, I don't. But God does. And he made provision for you, preparation for you, even in this moment, this beginning of Holy Week, this beginning of five days from now, he'll pay a tremendous price for my sin. Who would not love and serve a God like that? Today, as we repeat this account, I want 
the Holy Spirit to open up your ears that you might hear differently and that you'll respond differently or uh, with the grace that God all done for you. Lord, don't make me go to church on New Year's. But these two holidays are holidays where we generally come and we generally hear kind of the same story. I trust that the Holy Spirit will speak to us differently today and impact you in such a way that you'll say, let there never be another Palm Sunday where I remember what Christ has done for me and I remain the same. We have to be changed. The scriptures make this declaration, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, what's wrong with me? I mean, I I think I think the right way. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But we don't think like God. And until we do, we all stand in need of his sacrifice on our behalf, and we all have a need to have our minds renewed and transformed by his word. So I, I trust that that will happen for you today. This account, this triumphal entrance, is given in all of the synoptic gospels. If you're writing, I'll give you the address. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 17. Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. Luke 19, verse 29 through 40. And John 12, verses 12 through 19. These witnesses tell of this moment, and the scriptures make this declaration out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let all things be established. This morning you have four. They're telling you about how far Christ came for you. He came a long way. He did a great thing. And all he asked, love me, obey me, worship me. I trust that it, his sacrifice is worth it for you. It certainly is for me. I'm extremely grateful and I'm convicted by the message that I prepare for you every day. Please don't hear that I'm perfectly standing before you without need for a Savior. I need him. Every day that I live, I need him. Every day I live, I need to repent. And every day that I live, I need to be more like him. And why do I tell you that? Because the enemy will tell you, well, you don't measure up. You're not like fill in the blank. Everybody's got that fill in the blank person. So you don't pray like you should pray because you can't pray like sister so-and-so or brother this and that. You, you, you don't sing because you can't sing like this person or that person. You don't play and you don't use your gifts because there's other people better than you. Yet your God said you were fearfully and wonderfully made in him. He did not want you to be like me, and he didn't want you to be like your neighbor. He wanted you to be just like you. Can we do that? Can we make a commitment to say, God, I'm choosing to obey you today. And all the stuff that you've deposited inside of me, I want to use for your glory. May it be so. The prophet, Zechariah, in Zechariah 9.9, makes this declaration, Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Mark 11. And as they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Go into the village opposite you immediately as you enter. Enter it. You'll find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. 
And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord have need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. Verse 4. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside the street. And they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying that colt? And they told them just that Jesus had said. And they gave him permission. And they brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. And those who went into the front, and those who followed, were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple area, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. And on the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing from a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not his season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. I want to highlight some of the things that we've just read and then close out with an exhortation for us to follow. The the beginning of this story is Jesus is on his way. And there's there's a person who's blind and Jesus takes time to bring healing. And if you know the story, then you know that this blind person makes declaration about who Jesus is. You are the son of David. Which was a signal as to who he was. The Messiah. The promised one. The one Zechariah spoke of. Now, that's interesting because Christ, previously in his ministry, in his three and a half years of ministry, this is the first time where he allows people to make declaration about who he is. Letting you know that his time is coming. You may worship me for who I am. Interesting. And then his instruction to the disciples. He sent two of them and he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter, you'll find a colt tied there. Beth, Pash, and Bethany, sound familiar to you? How about Bethany? A few months ago, Pastor D preached a message concerning Lazarus. This was his hometown. So Christ knew something, and the people knew something. This was the guy that raised Lazarus from the dead. It's him. It's him. And so he didn't have to convince anybody as to who he was. Listen, if you'll just go over here and find this cult, let them know that I have need of it, and they'll give it to you. Why? Because the folks there knew who he was. They had experienced him, the miraculous, Someone who had been in the grave for three days come out alive. They did not forget. This moment where they bring this donkey to him, they begin to cover this donkey with their cloaks, which is interesting. Because in their day, how you dressed meant a whole lot about who you were in the society. As I was reading, I learned that a blind person was given a particular cloak so that he would be identified as such, so that they would be able to know how to care for him. It's not hard to 
identify. You go to any big city, it's not hard to identify one who might be homeless based on their dress. So don't think it's strange. It happens. Now, in our, in our world, we don't get it right all the time. But in their culture, this is one of the things that they did. They could tell that by their clothing, their wealth, designer, mm -hmm. you know, you know, y'all, uh, uh, we, uh, we pay a lot of money for somebody's name on our stuff. We pay extra money, uh, extra, extra money for somebody's name on our stuff. Because if we wear this suit, or if we wear these shoes, or if we wear this name, it somehow gives us access where we didn't used to have it. The example that the people are giving to Christ is, all that I am, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it under you. Now, your belongings, your, your valuables, the things that define you as men and women, do you submit those things to God? Is he allowed to have full authority over all that you possess? Or do you hold on to your own stuff? Uh, you don't understand. Uh, this is designer this or that. This purse costs this. I have a sibling who informed me, he said, Sean, I don't put anything on my feet unless it's $500. I said, well, you go. Because, <laughs> you know, I grew up with a single mama, projects, uh, welfare, food stamps. And uh, shockingly to our young adults, uh, we, we, went, we went, I got my shoes at the checkout line at the supermarket. And we, we didn't cry. We stood right there in the checkout line. She said, boy, try these on. <laughs> I don't like the color. I don't like the color. They ain't going to laugh at me. You got some on your feet, don't you? You better put these things on and be happy. Well, I wasn't happy, but I put them on. <laughs> the things that we possess can sometimes give definition to who we want to be or who we want people to think we are. I want to pick on the men for a minute. We've all been there. You meet a man for the very first time, and one of the first sentences out of his mouth after he learns your name is, oh, what do you do? What do you do? Because we want to rate this person and how, and how valuable their position allows them for me to give my time to. You know, don't be mad at me, but sometimes when men ask me that, I say, man, I, I, I'm down on my luck. I just got out of prison. <laughs> and uh, can we get together sometime too? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll call you. Give me your number. You don't hear from that brother no more. <laughs> But if I said, well, I'm the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, oh, yeah, oh, can we exchange contact information? I'd love to get with you. Why do we do that? The man who just got out of prison is just as valuable as the CEO of the Fortune 500 company. People of faith, us. We need to recognize that. So I'm asking you again. Will you take your cloak, all that defines you, your job, your wealth, your experience, your influence, your name, will you put that under the lordship of Christ? They did. And some of them didn't even know who he was. They just did it because everybody else was doing it. And they were shouting, Hosanna, 
not because they knew who he was or that they wanted to be saved. They were just going along with the crowd. All of us are guilty of just going along with the crowd sometimes, but not for the kingdom. When I was doing wrong in the inner cities of New Jersey, I I was doing stuff. And I'd hear somebody yell, police! I'd just start running. I'd run with the crowd. I'd run with the crowd. You know the guys who got caught? The guys who went, what? Where? I just start running. What are you running for? I don't know. (laughs) Figure it out later. (laughs) Run now. This big crowd, Bethany, entering into Jerusalem, this big crowd, Hosanna. 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 Who's this guy? Who is he? Now you've got the answer to your question, how five days later they can yell, crucify him. Crucify him. Uh, Five days ago, you were just worshiping. Then the circumstances changed. The influence changed. And you changed. He didn't stop being our Savior. So what changed? Yeah. Don't ever change. When you're in Christ, don't change. Don't throw it all away because the crowd says, because how how many of you know a day is coming when being a Christian won't be popular? It won't be popular. Will you worship him then? Or will you yell, crucify him? Will you give up everything that you have then? Because you'll be limited in your ability to live life unless you conform. So I'm not mad at these folks. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not mad. The same way they can say, Hosanna, this day? And then crucify him five days later? Those were my brothers and sisters. All fallen of Adam. All standing in need of what he had to give to them and to us. And if we're not careful, our lives will yell, crucify him. We need to do it right. Uh, Pastor Sean, you're just talking about a bunch of church stuff. Okay. Okay. See, if we get this right, our society is right, or or more right, than it was prior to. If those who are in authority, policemen, military, and politicians, if we recognize that people matter to God, We don't treat people the way that we do. We won't accidentally shoot anybody. We won't make harmful laws and legislation that divide people and hurt, particularly those who are less fortunate. See, if we do it God's way, if our minds are renewed and we are truly transformed, then this right here, what you're in, It will be the rule rather than the exception. What am I saying? To be in a place of worship on a Sunday at 20 minutes to one with people who are black and white and Latino, people who are young and people who are older, people who are wealthy and people who are not so wealthy, people who have position and influence, And people who do not, all worshiping the same God. What did Pastor Diggs order? This is what heaven is like 
Well, I'm just going somewhere where I'm comfortable. Well, who told you to do that? <laughs> the cross wasn't comfortable. But you were worth it. You don't do whatever you want anytime you want to. You don't take your life. You don't ingest poison into your body. You don't damage the lives of other people, their expense, their reputation, all because of how you feel. Shame on us. He came a long way. It cost him a lot. Hosanna. Hosanna. So this donkey wasn't just him sitting on a beast of burden. He was symbolizing the fact that I'm coming as a servant. That donkey, that's a servant animal. It's a servant animal. The animal of a king, a war horse. A war horse. So he was sending a message. I am who I am. But I'm going to lay down all that I am so that I don't offend, so that I don't hurt, so that I accomplish the will of my God. In this moment, this entry came as a servant a humble servant. But there'll be a moment when he'll crack the sky and he'll come back for his people. And he won't be on a donkey. He'll be on a war horse. And he'll call you by name. (laughs) One leader said, you know, the Bible teaches, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. <laughs> He'll descend with a shout. Anybody know what he's going to shout? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm going to be shouting too. <laughs> Ho! <laughs> and now he'll come. And he won't give of himself in that way, but he'll take full authority. He'll take his position and he'll bring us with him. That's something to celebrate. You mean you can use me? You mean you you mean me? Yes, you. Put your name there. But I but I never but they always told me, but I was never given uh I didn't have uh I was the I was the wrong color. I was the wrong gender. I was the wrong age. I was the wrong... mm. Jesus says, you're mine. All of your messed up stuff, all of your ways, you've put it under my authority. Now come on. Because he's not looking at you like you look at you. God is looking at us through the refracted light of his shed blood. You, You walk out to this beautiful Myrtle Beach, after a rainstorm, you'll see a rainbow. The colors are not actually there. You see them, but they're really not there. What they're hitting are beads of water. Reflect, refracted light are hitting that water. And when they appear, this is how it'll appear. Wow. So God looks at us through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Some people will say, well, he's, you're covered with the blood. Yes, you are. 
Yes, you are. So if I'm covered with the blood, there's no more need for me to concern myself with my past. Everything is about my future and who God has formed, molded, and shaped me to be. And your friends will go, well, I remember when you used to. Hey, man, you remember when we used to. Yeah. What a sad time. We used to have so much fun. No, 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 we were dying. We were dying. We just didn't know it. We were deceived. Now we're going and we're going to have life. And we're going to have life in abundance. Praise God. So as we move forward, I want to give you some highlights about these palms that you're holding. You know, when I was growing up, we'd come to church and we'd get these. And as boys, we would just, we would, well, we would sword fight. <laughs> and then we'd come home and my mother would take them and she'd, she'd fold them into a cross and she'd put them up on the wall or the refrigerator or whatever it was. And I had no idea what that meant. It's interesting that they began to use palms. A palm produces its peak fruit at 30 years old. 30 years old. Well, that's interesting. The Levitical law said you couldn't be a priest until you were 30. Okay, that didn't get you yet? <laughs> Somebody know where I'm going? Yes. Yes. Jesus began his ministry at 30. So for all of y'all to say I'm too young, no, you're not. Step into the purpose for which you've been made by God and watch and see. There was affirmation, 30. Jesus, 30. High priest, 30. Peak production, 30. The Bible doesn't waste a thing. Not a thing. So we hear the story where he went into the temple. I got to speed up a little bit. He went into the temple. He looked around. He left because it was too late. But then he comes back. And when he comes back the next day, he sees a fig tree. He walks over because he sees the leaves and he wonders, are there fruit? Finding none, he curses the tree. Wow, how unfair is that? Anybody ever know Jesus to be unfair? You ever wonder, am I the only one that read this scripture and go, hmm, that doesn't sound right? Because it goes on to say that it wasn't in season. The tree wasn't in season. So you wouldn't have gone over expecting fruit to eat. Except the fact that Jesus knew this truth. That tree should have produced Breba fruit. Breba, B-R-E-B-A. Produced in the spring, this time of year. Produced in the spring. The common fig is not due until the fall. So where does the Breba fruit come from? It comes from the surplus of the previous year. Oh, wow. Come on. The previous year. And you know who does eat the Breba? The poor. Poor people can go and pick from the, from the fig tree and eat. It's not as good as a regular fig. It's tart, acidic, but it feeds your belly. I hate oatmeal. I hate it. I just hate it. See, y'all got the fun oatmeal. Y'all got the fun oatmeal that falls out with the fruit and the sugar? No, no, no. We got that oatmeal you got cooked three times. And you pick that stuff up and you try to eat that stuff. You can't even open your mouth. Paste. And my, my mother would go, boy, eat that. I go, it don't taste good. 
She said, don't you realize children of Africa are starving? I said, well, send it to the children of Africa. She said, smack. She said, and I dare you to go call somebody. What am I saying? When you don't have anything, something has value to you. That tree should have produced in such a way that it had leftovers in the spring. Your life should produce in such a way that even if it's not your season, somebody can eat from your life. If they're not... Listen, if you haven't made way for somebody to eat from your life, God, don't curse us. Have mercy on us. We did not know. We didn't know, we didn't know, we didn't know. Our outreach offering ought to be filled to the overflow. Well, I gave my tithe on Sunday. Last Sunday. I didn't ask you for your tithe. I ask you for Breba so that we can touch the lives of people in this community. We're not consuming it on ourselves. Believe me. Believe me, we're not. Ron Lewis is probably watching, and he won't let us. I'm going to tell you that right now. (laughs) So here's my exhortation. What are we producing in our lives that allows for others to benefit from what we do? And then finally, quickly, Jesus goes into the temple. Y'all know the story. Where he overturns the tables and he calls them thieves. This house of prayer, you've made it a den of thieves. How so? With unjust weights and measures. You see, people were coming to the temple at this time because it was their obligation to worship God. And their ability to worship God was being made difficult, if not impossible, because they were being ripped off. They had to bring offering, but they couldn't carry the offering, the miles that it took for them to get to where they needed to be. So they had stands set up for people to come, where everything was overpriced. And where it wasn't overpriced, they had used unjust weights to steal from them, hollowed out, stealing, as people are only trying to worship their God. May rise never be a place where we make it hard for people to worship their God the true and living God. It should be made easy. And it shouldn't be conditional. Now, I applaud all of you. Because on more than one occasion, we had a family in our church that would bring a homeless man here. And he'd sit among you. And not one of you treated him poorly. Not one of you. May that be the definition of rise when we're 100 when we're 1,000, and when we're 10,000. May we make the way to God easy. Don't use the unjust weights and measures. Well, how so? Well, I don't want to talk to that person because they're a single mother, and clearly they've been sinning, and They've got all these kids, and the kids are unruly, and I don't want to talk to that person because they've had multiple abortions, and I don't want to talk to that person because, well, they live in a trailer home, not like me, and I don't want to deal with that person because fill in the blank. 
unjust weights and measures. Jesus died for us all. Sin? Here's my takeaway. I've left you with a few. Sin is always present when we elevate ourselves above God. Everything that we are and everything that we do needs to be brought under his leadership, which is why they took the palms. They laid them down. They took their coats. They laid them down. The equivalent of their red carpet of the day to recognize who he was. Pastor Brian, who clearly didn't know what I was preaching, but he said, all of your sin, lay it down. What will you lay down? Lay it down today. Really, don't go, out, don't go out and do it again. Lay it down here. Lay it down. Let the authority of God walk over your circumstance, over your sin, over your bondage, your addiction, over your problem, over your circumstance, over your fear, over And if in that moment you can truly say, Hosanna, Hosanna. There's never been a moment where you have had an opportunity to submit your ways to the true and living God. This is your opportunity right now. If you don't know Jesus Christ and you're in this room or you're online, would you please pray this prayer with me? This is your opportunity to repent of sin, having heard now the truth, saying, God, I want to turn to you. I want that kind of Father. I want that kind of Lord. I want that kind of Savior. Nothing, everybody say nothing, can separate you from the love of God. Please pray. Say, Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that the separation between us is because of my sin. I confess that I have sinned. I have fallen far short of your Lord. I trust Jesus. I want to turn away from everything the Bible calls sin and receive Jesus as my Lord, Master, and Savior. Help me to love, serve, and obey you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hosanna to our God in the highest.